Thank you so much, Mary. And my appreciation to all of the organizers and um, all of the, the panelists today for, for really developing and executing a great webinar and, and also the, the entire webinar series, such an important topic around addressing acute malnutrition in the African lands. And uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and good evening to all of you in attendance today. Next slide, please. Helen started us out in the webinar today with some information on food security and malnutrition in African drylands. And I'll take just a moment for us to consider some of the components of the global situation that are relevant for the way in which FAO is approaching the work that we can do in support of addressing acute malnutrition. So globally, as you know, we've all committed uh, through the sustainable development goals to reduce wasting. And wasting has currently affected roughly 50 million children or more than 7% of all children under five at any given time. And despite decades of efforts and advancing knowledge and capacities, um, still only one in three of severely wasted children is receiving the treatment that they need. So there is no way that we can address the problem or the burden of, of wasting or acute malnutrition that we, in a, in a way that we've already committed to doing without really a revolution in prevention. And to sustainably address the challenge of hunger, malnutrition, and particularly acute malnutrition, we have to achieve a combination of improving health services, strengthening social protection uh, mechanisms, and sustainable and resilient food systems that can ensure access to healthy diets year round. Next slide, please. But what is a healthy diet? A healthy diet is a diet that's sufficient in quantity and quality, meaning it meets all of the nutritional needs, not just calories, but it also means that it's safe and that it consists of a diversity of foods. And so how can we ensure this, especially for children and vulnerable women year round? Well, we know that diets are influenced by personal behavior, often called consumer behavior, but in the sense of being the consumer of the food, not a consumer that uh, in the sense of purchasing, but in consumption of food. So th this is all of us. There are decisions that we make about when, where, and what to eat, and caregivers make these decisions on behalf of young children. However, we can't merely tell people to eat better diets. We can't merely tell caregivers, give children better diets. This is something that uh, Suzanne touched on in her presentation. And from a food systems approach, the reason is, is it, it's not, the reason that this is not adequate is because personal behavior choices are not made in a vacuum. They also depend on the food environment. That is what is available, what's economically accessible, as well as what is appealing. Nonetheless, we cannot merely tell vendors in the markets just to offer more foods that are needed for a diverse diet in their stalls. And this is because food environments are dependent on a larger food supply chain infrastructure, which includes production inputs, production, storage, distribution, processing and packaging, and marketing of foods. And this is going to look very different in different contexts. But nonetheless, this entire infrastructure is going to affect perishability of foods and it's going to affect food safety. All of this is influenced by what we've been talking about today, the political, programmatic, and institutional actions and environments. So the entirety of what you see on this slide is what we mean by a food system. So the bottom line is in order for us to ensure that we can address malnutrition sustainably, we can't merely provide food at, an, at, at a given time of crisis. We also need to ensure that there's coordinated efforts across the range of actors and institutions and sectors that can ensure that diverse foods are produced, that they're handled and processed appropriately, that they're distributed, marketed, and priced fairly, and then that they're purchased or they're procured and they're prepared and they're cooked and they're consumed adequate to the needs of all of the individuals in a household. You can think of this system like a balloon that's full of water. No matter where on that balloon you squeeze, 
the whole balloon is gonna re be reshaped by the water squishing around. And when we take a food system approach to thinking about how young children can be assured of diets that are safe and diverse and include sufficient quantity and quality, we recognize how actions across the system are interlinked or how we are making that water move around that balloon. And in doing so, we can work towards actions that balance the water and keep that balloon from breaking to achieve sustainability across the system. Next slide, please. And for those of you that are familiar with this food system for nutrition diagram from the high level panel of experts report, you'll know already that food systems are also influenced and influence a number of critical factors related to sustainable development, such as gender equity and equality, the environmental context, economic growth, demographics, including immigration, et cetera. All of this needs to be taken into account in a systems approach. But this also gives us an unparalleled opportunity to influence goals across the entirety of the SDGs. And it's also a great opportunity because food systems are the sources of livelihood for livelihoods for billions of people across the globe. Over 1.5 billion people are directly employed in agriculture and more than 4.5 billion people depend on the food system in some way for their jobs and livelihoods. That means that while they work to produce, collect, store, process, transport, and distribute food to consumers, they also depend on that work to guarantee their own access to healthy diets and food for themselves and their entire families, including young children. Thus, when we work in a food system approach, one thing that we always keep in mind is ensuring decent wages and protection of livelihoods across the entirety of the food system. And this is part of the process to strengthen food systems for ensuring healthy diets. So what does this look like, putting this theory into practice? I've got two examples that I'll quickly go through today. So in 2018 in Somalia, there was a two year long drought that was followed by heavy rains and that led to widespread, widespread flooding. In response to the large scale food insecurity and the shock to livelihoods that this brought about, a number of partners launched what's referred to as the Somalia Emergency Drought Response and Recovery Project. It's a long name. And this had an aim of mitigating the risk of malnutrition. It's often referred to as a cash plus program. So cash plus in Somalia is the shorthand that's often used. And it was meant to tackle the challenge of food insecurity and malnutrition with complementary actions across the entirety of the food system for greater sustainability and impact. There was support provided in the form of agricultural inputs for farmers and support to pastoralists and capacity strengthening in handling techniques to increase food safety standards and strengthen supply chains for diverse vegetables and for milk and dairy. This was combined with financial support to increase families' purchasing power for making more foods available to those families because they were made more affordable. And supporting infrastructure for storage to increase food stability, such as hermetically sealed bags and containers for milk products. Finally, there was a consumer awareness campaign and nutrition education efforts in communities and in households emphasized both men and women for equal empowerment, which were complemented at the policy level with the development of a context relevant nutrition and food safety education guideline document. Next slide, please. And a second example comes from South Sudan. Similar efforts were underway, have been underway in a number of areas in South Sudan where food insecurity and risk of malnutrition is prevalent, which unfortunately has been in a lot of the country since the increase in civil unrest started in 2016. To respond to this protracted crisis, FAO and a number of partners have implemented a nutrition-sensitive voucher program using a food systems approach. 
Food supply chains are strengthened through inputs and capacity for cultivating diverse crops that can be harvested year round and improved post harvest handling, such as using solar dryers for vegetables in order to increase shelf life and food safety. Food environments have been strengthened through a market assessment to target outlets that can manage the provision of diverse foods as part of the voucher program, providing vendors with a stable market and with increased capacities to support their livelihoods. Consumer behavior has been supported through the provision of vouchers for, for fish, dairy, vegetables, and meat, a number of different foods needed for a healthy diet. And this is especially important through targeting households with children at high risk for malnutrition. The impact is short-term ability to access foods from the market, but also longer-term sustainability of healthy diets through strengthened supply and capacities across the entirety of the food system. So in summary, for FAO, our focus has been on building a strong foundation to pursue the vision of a world free from hunger and malnutrition, where food and agriculture contribute to improving live, living standards of all in an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable manner. There's a critical need to shift our focus from a single component agri-food interventions towards this systems approach. It's the only way that we're gonna shift the dial on malnutrition and eventually reach our ambitious targets for wasting reduction. Thank you very much for your attention and back over to you, Mary.